All right. So um, like I said, it's beneficial for uh, most of my students. Obviously, they have to understand the ins and outs of each of the domains and the standards and whatnot. But a large part of people's difficulty with the PPR is not um, uh, an ignorance of knowledge with, with pedagogy, but it is not mindfully or carefully reading the questions and, and sort of getting some wrong because of the way that the exam is created and the way that it is a critical reading exam. And we do have to pay attention to keywords and phrases to make sure we're really doing what the question is asking us to do in the goal. Are we achieving the goal? Did we make sure to assess all of the nuanced elements that we have in in teaching and education right students their diversity in a myriad of ways skills preferences development um language proficiency and and other and making sure that we are adjusting the the assignments the assessments um based on those based on those keywords and phrases that we've chosen the answer choice that most aligns with what we analyzed as the goal in the scenario and um, that we made sure that it did take into consideration as much as it needed to the keywords and phrases, the details. And I always say the devil is in the details <laughs> and it is, especially for this exam, details, details, details. So being mindful, I'm just gonna, we're on 61 right now. I think we left off on, yeah, we did. Cause we did this ELPS, uh, not sheltered instructional training question. Um, we're going to go back up and review the strategies. And, and I want to do that because this is something you would do with your students. No matter how many times I've said the strategies to you, I'm going to say them again. We're going to review them again. And so that everybody knows, um, and some of you, maybe this is your first time. And if it is, then you need it also. So making sure that I revisit important ideas, um, skills, processes or strategies with students every single time I use I we do them so that it becomes second nature so that you do those things on the exam and that's something we would also do with our students even though I'm not in a physical classroom I am still a teacher people ask me all the time don't you miss teaching I'm like I teach every day I mean I teach all the time <laughs> what is it that you mean I just teach a different grade level now dealing with different content areas and, and different problems and whatnot, but it's teaching nonetheless. So let's go over our strategies really quickly. We're going to mindfully read the questions. We can't just do a surface reading really quickly. I want you to ask yourself, utilize those metacognitive skills, thinking about your thinking. What did I just read? What's important? And what, what is it, this in layman's terms, mindfully get the, the goal, extract that goal, which is number two. What is the goal either for the student or the teacher or just the question in general? What is the goal or objective of this? What is the point? What are they wanting us to do? What are they needing us to do theoretically in order to make this best practice, in order to make this most appropriate? Um, what key words and phrases what details did they give me? Because we're like investigators here trying to find out what pedagogically is the best choice. What keywords and phrases or red flags, I call them, should you pay attention to? They're red flags because they're important. And you need to pause for a moment and think what strategies, what activities, what, what theoretical framework do I need to keep in mind as I'm thinking about the goal in the scenario, as I'm trying to address um, you know, the, the question or the goal. Make sure your answer addresses or attends or is parallel to the keywords and phrases. And of course, the goal. It has to address the goal. You have to succeed in achieving the goal with that answer choice. If it doesn't, if it changes it, if it's not on par with what the goal wants, it cannot be the right answer. So we've gone through several of these with different content areas, the pedagogical um, analysis of it. And so we're going to continue with that. And I wanted to start off with our ELLs because everybody knows that that makes up a large portion 
Uh, there's a lot of questions having to do with English language learners and the acquisition and the support of acquisition of another language or of English language. Um, and so this, this is important for not just our ELL students, but also for our native English speakers. We also want for them to become better and acquire more varied, um, complex English language knowledge. Wait, did I skip one? Do, do, do. I did, here we are. I just want to ask real quick, um, this that you're getting these questions from, this isn't in the drive anywhere for us to print out. Is that correct? I, I, I'm so sorry. I'm going to put it in there today. Okay. All right. I just, all right. Thank you. I'm yeah. Ready. Thank you for reminding me. I actually was going to do that and I have just like forgotten. I have so many different drives for all the different content areas and the particulars that everybody needs. And so sometimes I, uh, you know, do a misstep, but I'll make sure to add <laughs> No, it. that's fine. I just have been practicing questions and it's a lot easier to answer when you're right there holding your hand. <laughs> and so anyway. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you just okay. kind of hear my, my voice in your head. I've actually had students tell me, I remember like that you say, like, does this address? I'm like, what? Whatever works for you. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right. So let um let's begin with this one with our ELL uh, analysis. So uh, as we go through each of these, um, I think it's important for us to think about this in terms of the PPR. What domains are our ELL? Do we have our that specifics about ELL students? There's two main domains that where where we have to really have a, a solid knowledge about English language learners and the particulars that need supports that need to uh, be in place in order for those students to thrive on grade level. Can can somebody tell me? You don't have to be right, but just think about the domains of the exam. We were talking about the keywords and phrases for for the different areas of the exam. Where domain where three. You? Domain three, for sure, within domain three, there are particular competencies, right, about English language proficiency standards, the ELPS pertaining to- go over three and four. You stopped us at one and two. That's correct. That's correct. I did, but you're right. Three, but also which other one that we did cover? One. Yes, ma'am. It is important for our instruction, instructional planning and our assessments that we take ELLs and their needs into consideration and also during implementation during the doing of it, the application of those strategies and the communication and feedback that we utilize in order to implement and um, uh, sort of create that positive learning experience where they're acquiring language and getting content knowledge also. So yes, domains one and domain three. Domain one is more about the planning ahead of it, thinking of it, Domain three is in the nitty gritty. You are doing it. It is your application of those plans, your knowledge of your students, and how best you make that magic happen in the classroom. So let's take a look at this one. We have 61. English language learners, ELLs in the a second grade class are beginning an interdisciplinary unit about plants. To help the ELLs monitor their own learning during the unit, it would be most effective for the teacher too. Now let's go back to our, our testing strategies. Mindfully read it. That was not a mindful reading. That was just me reading it, right? Let me go back and be mindful. What keywords and phrases do you see? Their own learning. Thank you. That is so important. Their own learning. What else? Interdisciplinary unit. Yeah, it's an interdisciplinary unit and it's about plants. What is so important about second grade? Second grade. Yeah, it's a second grade class and it's at the beginning of, not at the end of it or in the middle, at the beginning for our ELLs, which is also important, obviously. Um, this teacher is trying to get the students to monitor their understanding, right? Their learning at the from the beginning portion of this interdisciplinary unit, meaning it has lots of disciplines all in one about plants. So we're looking for um, an effective strategy, right? Which would be most effective. And, and when they say most, 
it's because they might, may probably have given you more than one appropriate and or effective response, but one is better than the others based on the particulars, the details, keywords and phrases, and our goal. So our goal is to do an effective strategy that'll help students monitor or consider their learning or understanding, right? Let's take a look at the answer choices and uh, and then and then eliminate them as we can bet ourselves $5 that's not the answer. I mean, they have to have a reason, something behind it, a rationale based on it not matching up with keywords and phrases, being inappropriate for the grade level or for the goal. That Those are valid reasons to, to get rid of an answer choice. Provide them with a checklist of all activities in the unit and encourage them to mark off each activity as it is completed. Encourage them to keep all of their all of their unit work in a folder and keep a record of each grade or teacher comment on the inside cover. Help them develop a learning log in which they write what they know about plants and then verify their understandings throughout the unit. Four, teach them how to use reference materials about plants and then encourage them to correct their own errors on unit work. Okay. Any of these jump out at you as a bet yourself $5, it's not the right answer. One. Or, oh, okay, one. One, right, so why would we get rid of one? You're right, one is not the right answer. What are we trying to do? Remember, what is the goal? We're looking for a strategy that will help them think about their learning or understanding, right? Monitor their learning or understanding. And this one just, is a checklist of activities to be, it's a completion log, right? This is a completion log here. But does completion log equal understanding or thinking about your thinking? No. Not no. at all. No, no, no. Okay, so which one of other one of these is also not thinking about your thinking? Because that's monitoring your understanding. She just wants them to engage in a metacognitive skill to practice it. Two wouldn't be a one. good option. Two would not be a good option. So encourage them so they have all their work again. So this is instead of the checklist, it's all the work, right? It's more like on accountability and responsibility. Yeah, a little bit. Bad. Exactly. Yeah. But it's not really reflecting on the learning. Even this added comment and the grade, that's not their understanding. And, and we're there own learning not our comment <clears throat> okay what else can we throw away or get rid of number four um, absolutely number, number four. four okay teach them to use so this strategy of teaching them to use reference materials uh, and then encourage them to correct their own errors on unit work would it help them monitor their understanding No, because they corrected their own errors, so they don't even know if they got the right error again. Right, so they're not thinking about their understanding. They're thinking about like their application, but not necessarily um, thinking about their own thinking. Number three, helping them develop and a learning log is an excellent strategy. If you see that somewhere, you should say, oh, this is because it's a uh, metacognitive sort of practice that learning log what do you already know it's kind of like a kwl chart but in a learning log where they they can go and add to all the different pieces as they learn and say oh i know more about this then and now my understanding is different or i was uh misunderstood i'm misunderstanding this section and now that i do it so verifying their understandings verifying their understandings thinking about their thinking and then uh, seeing if it matches so this is, I already told you it was wrong and you use reference materials and I encourage you to correct, encourage you, not even requiring it, but I'm just encouraging you to do it on your own, um, as opposed to you keeping your own ideas and thinkings and understandings in a learning log and then going back and looking at them and thinking, was I right about that or 
like I was a little right, but I missed all this other part. There's actually more to know. That activity of reflecting back on what you already thought in your brain and building on that is uh, an, an invaluable skill in monitoring their learning, monitoring their own understanding. And um, as you practice it over the years, it becomes automatic. I do it all the time ad nauseum. It's awful. <laughs> Once you get to like a certain level of always asking yourself, like, did I understand that? Or what can I learn more? And you just do it on your own. And that's how we want students to be. It's not really awful. I'm joking. It, but but it is, you know, taxing and you do are always looking at things in a sort of critical um, trying to understand life learner type perspective. And we want the students to be there. Any questions on this one? You guys are so good. Got all the keywords and phrases, just started knocking out the bad ones. Okay. Something's happening. My computer is frozen. Can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I don't know what's happening, but my computer is like frozen. Okay, there. Now, never mind. Silly me. Okay, so another question regarding English language proficiency standards and ELPS. Let's take a look at it. Remembering what we're mindfully reading, looking for keywords and phrases to jump out at us. Mr. Ola, I hope I'm saying that right. A bilingual teacher helps English language learners, ELLs, make a list of questions to guide and improve their writing. Then he encourages them to develop the habit of referring to the questions during the writing process. The following are some examples of the questions. Why am I writing this? Who will read it? What is the clearest way to express my ideas? Mr. Ulas approach is benefiting the ELLs primarily by developing their ability to, and we don't know what they're going to say, but let's go back and see um, what, what is going on here. There, I saw keywords and phrases as we were reading already that I would like to highlight. Let's see if you guys can guess the ones I saw. Guide and improve. Guide and improve writing. What else? So he wants his habit. Yeah, yeah the habit. Develop habits. Right. He wants them to develop a habit. That's excellent. Obviously, ELLs is a big one. That's a freebie. There's one more missing. He wants them to use the questions during the writing process? During the writing process, as mm -hmm. they are writing, during, in the nitty gritty, in the process. Not before they begin writing, not like the whole, during the whole process, right? Important. So <clears throat> from beginning, middle to end. And we have these questions. Why am I writing this? Who will read it? What's the clearest way of expressing my ideas? And so the question is asking us what? What is the question asking in Lemon's terms? How does this help the ELL students in their ability to write, right? In their ability to write. I want that specifically. How is it helping? It says benefiting. The approach is benefiting primarily. When they say primarily, it's maybe because they gave you a couple of ways, but mostly this is the most beneficial or like important reason. So Mr. Ula is having the students um, think of these questions, referring to these questions, and we have examples, during their own writing process um, as a means to do what? To help them how? How is this helping the ELO students utilizing these questions during? Let's take a look and then, as we go through them, think of reasons why they might not fit with our goal, with our um, keywords and phrases and, and the like. Work independently to improve their writing skills. Adjust the reading level of their finished written work. Assess their writing progress over the course of the year. Self-correct their written mistakes.
can we eliminate number two? Yeah, where is the discussion about a reading level at all? Is there reading anywhere here? No, no. the reading level is not part of it. That, that's not, and they don't adjust their reading levels. <clears throat> they work on improving them, but we're doing writing right now and that's not what is being done at all. Eliminate number four. Eliminate number four. Do the questions even ask about or tell them to reflect back or check their grammar or is it have anything to do with going in and checking for mistakes at all? No, not at all. I mean, you, you could do a list and, and if I had a different list of questions and it, it was like, did I capitalize all the beginning words in the sentence? Did I put punctuations? Did I organize my writing in two paragraphs? That might be, number four might be the correct answer for that because it is helping them keep in mind common mistakes in writing and helping them self-correct those mistakes by keeping it in mind. That's not what's happening here. Remember, we are developing a habit and a skill to help their ability to do something. What, what is it? Do we wanna help the student's ability to work independently to improve their writing skills or to assess their writing progress over the course of a year? Number one. Yes, ma'am. Why is number three not the right answer and we can bet ourselves $5? Because it's a course of the end of the year. Right. I mean, sorry, over the, the year. Yeah, over right. The year. Over the course of the year. And, mm -hmm. and it isn't even an assessment. Like we're not even really having them assess their writing progress. It, we're having them think about writing, thinking about their audience, thinking about clarity of ideas. And remember, we're working with ELL students. And so these are important ideas to have for them as they are improving their writing skills. So it would absolutely, it's another metacognition skill, but for writing, right? Making sure I'm thinking, am I right? Is my writing doing the things that I need it to do and expressing the ideas and having those questions and going back and reading your work and actually, uh, you know, applying an answer to that question based on that. So we want to work to, uh, we want to work to have them be more independent in their thinking and in their writing, but we have to ask have to have them ask certain questions of themselves and this activity prompts them to get into the habit of doing so so even when they move out of mr ula's uh, classroom i guarantee you if they were there all year long next year they're gonna, they might ask themselves those questions in their mind their teacher might not have those questions for them or this strategy but after that sustained, consistent strategy that he utilized, it'll be something ingrained and part of their metacog metacognitive process during these academic and like, you know, learning activities. We good on this one? Any questions about ELLs or, or any, um, any, points of clarity that you need when I see the when we see the word assess are we automatically going to assume that means to test or to, like use that in a way to quiz or to well it is it's a, it's a measurement it's always a measure always measurement okay all right. right it's always I'm okay. measuring like and so if I if I we were having the students assess their progress then they might over, but this is over the course of the year, and we want them to do this during the writing process. Uh, assessing your writing over the course of a year might include looking at your past essays, like in a portfolio, and then responding to questions about it. Like, how does your writing change from the beginning of the year to the end? Like, what? And that would have them think about and sort of measure what was I good at? What did I get better at? What am I still not good at? In that way, it would be an assessment, not necessarily an exam, but a measurement. Yeah. Of, so I, um, right. I just wanted to see, like, I can replace that word with measurement. And that makes more sense to me as why that I can eliminate that one from 
the answer choice. If that Absolutely. was on the test. And that's, okay. that's important to think of it that way, you know, try to put it in layman's terms. It makes it easier for us to understand what is, what doesn't work and, and what the question is really asking us. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to just move this down because I don't like it. It's like this. All right. I told you I was going to be thick on our focusing in the needs of our English language learners, which I just have to add. I know if you've watched my videos, you've seen it, but these students are amazing students. Most of my best writers, if not all of them, <laughs> were advanced high ELL students. Just their access to two different separate vocabulary uh, you know, it, it just, and their ability to use um, synonyms that other maybe English, uh, native English speakers wouldn't have chosen because that, that, that word doesn't mean the same thing in another language to them. And so they're just, the writing is much more complex, but they do need support because their task is monumental. I cannot imagine, and I'm someone who's super like is proud of my nerd status. And I enjoyed being a nerd in, in elementary. It was not a, a, like a, a jab at me to say like, oh, you nerdy girl who gets good grades like that. I've tried. Um, so if I had to move to another country and I didn't know the language and I therefore felt ignorant by default because I am lacking access to language, it would be really hard on me mentally. Just ask who I am as a person. And I'm just thinking about myself. Our students that come, they're experiencing culture shock. They're, they're being tasked with learning content specific stuff, academic specific stuff on grade level without having ac full access to the language. It's an incredible task that they all rise up to the expectation. And I'm telling you, knock it out of the park once they're advanced high and taking like AP classes and stuff like that. It's just amazing if the right supports are there, which is why it's so important and why the state so heavily tests um, these types of questions. So let's get into this one. Which of the following social studies activities would be most appropriate for English language learners who are reading and speaking at the intermediate language proficiency level in English? Okay, so what keywords and phrases, let's um, make sure we mindfully read this by identifying keywords and phrases and you know explicitly stating what the goal is here. Social studies activities. Social studies activity. Okay. ELL. ELL. <laughs> Most appropriate. Most appropriate should tell us maybe they gave us more than one, right? Uh, intermediate yeah. language. Oh, intermediate. 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 That's important. Intermediate. What yeah. are the levels that we have? Oh, hold on. Beginning, have... intermediate, advanced, advanced high. Thank you. Who is that? That was awesome. Who was that who said that? You get five points. Uh, Ms. Huerta. Hello, Ms. Huerta. Yes, you're right. Advanced <clears throat> and advanced. Hi. Hi. Um, and, and they're usually labeled like this. B, I, A, A, H. <clears throat> so our advanced and our advanced high need uh, advanced high need like zero supports right possibly negative one supports they are on par with our native english speakers um advanced might need still need some supports very 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 few intermediate still need a good amount and beginners need all hands on deck so we are looking specifically for something in the intermediate range, right? So let's keep that in mind as we're looking for the most appropriate social studies activity. But what else is important in this um, one last keyword and phrase? It's so, so important. Reading and speaking. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, it's so important. This is the goal. This is what we wanna improve. Reading and speaking is the goal. It's not social studies per se in this question. Remember, it's not about the content area. It's about the goal. We are trying to increase reading and speaking skills in our intermediate ELL students. And they're asking us which of these social studies activities would best help ELL 
intermediate students with reading and speaking. Okay, let's take a look. Drawing individual family portraits and naming the people in them. Participating in a guided discussion about community helpers and reading a passage about them. Creating a model of a neighborhood out of a small cardboard, small cardboard boxes with labels identifying a school, a town, and other community buildings. Making a collage for magazine pictures of various forms of transportation and reading passages about them. So which one of these draw looks like they would not be a good answer and tell me why one yes tell me why I think it's more of a beginning um level and it would be more towards writing because they're naming the people or maybe like a little bit of speaking right but maybe at a beginning a little level. bit but we don't even really know maybe if they like this is vague right but you're right in that this is more beginner right this is beginner they're yeah. drawing family portraits and then labeling one word possibly saying that word not high on the reading right um and not super high on the speaking saying one name is not practicing speech it just isn't so this isn't the best activity it's certainly not the most appropriate so Excellent job for identifying why that is not the answer. What else can we eliminate because it doesn't achieve our goal or address the two main most important points, which are reading and speaking skills? Number three. three. Yeah, number three. Number three. So we're, they're creating a model and that's perfectly visual and fine. But with labels, this is writing. This isn't even speaking, right? So they... Yeah, there's no very, very minimal reading um, and almost no speaking or no speaking from what I can gather. So this doesn't do it. It is certainly not the most appropriate because it's leaving out speaking and there's no real sense of reading that's there. We're down to the dreaded two, right? Yes. I would say number four yeah. is out. Yes, number four is mm -hmm. out. Somebody tell me why. Because again, they're only reading. Oh, sorry. So um, they have one part, right? They read a passage <clears throat> about forms of transportation, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any speaking going on here? No. None. A guided discussion? Yes, because they need to be guided. <clears throat> intermediates need guidance they need guidance guided instruction is best practice for beginner yeah. and especially intermediate right yeah, and all... they follow up and they do read a passage about them so they yeah. have a guided discussion guided with support. i'm sorry who's that Oh, I'm sorry. I can, we can hear you. I'm <laughs> sorry. Whoever's talking. My participants. Okay. Um, two is the only one, the only one that does both, that attends to both goals, reading and speaking for English language learners. And they're going to be specific and, and, and it's going to come off in a way where you're just reading it mindlessly and you don't hone in on oh they're looking for oral language and the best answer choice you chose was for you know reading or writing and it was an amazing activity but it doesn't address the goal be careful and mindful with your analysis of the scenario and the questions to make sure you've identified keywords and phrases for the goal what specifics if it's an english language learner our goals are always going to be to increase their language proficiency and there's four different areas oral right or the speaking listening speaking reading and writing in those in those areas and so they're going to be tricky by trying to ask you particulars i want my elos to be better listeners okay well and there's strategies to help them with that and at the different levels different strategies for beginners because they need more supports different strategies for intermediates because they still need supports but but they have more language so we change it add some stuff and um there the document in the drive the tea document that is uh predominantly about 
intermediate and beginners is so fantastic. So if you haven't already done a, a, a critical read of that, a deep reading of it, you should, because it gives really great graphics that breaks down. It gives you specifics for each of the areas for listening skills. What can I do to help beginners engage in the lesson or understand the lesson and build their skills? What can I do for intermediates? So on and so forth. So it, I think it's a gem and I uh, encourage everyone, if you haven't already, you know, looked at it in earnest that you do that. Any questions from this one? No. Let's separate this one again. Okay, that didn't help, it's still, okay, here. All right, again, we have another social studies class. And again, on your PPR exam, they will ask, about a math teacher, a math teacher, a science teacher is doing this. It's not about the content. It is about your pedagogical knowledge, your knowledge of instruction and planning that's appropriate for all students, your knowledge of creating a classroom environment that is, you know, a place of rapport, respect, and learning for all so that all students can learn, your ability to implement effective communication, feedback, responsive instruction strategies to get the, so that your students get effective instruction and mastery and your application of your, um, you know, ethical and legal responsibilities, uh, professional responsibilities. So it's not about the content. So this one's about social studies. So social studies class, including English language learners, ELLs, at varying levels of English language proficiency is analyzing the reasons for the colonization of North America. The lesson plan states that students will read the colonization of North America sections in their social studies text and independently complete a timeline detailing the establishment of the 13 colonies. Which of the following instructional activities is most beneficial in helping ELLs build background knowledge prior to the assignment. All right, lots and lots of words. And what I, in my brain, was highlighting keywords and phrases. So let me see if you saw the ones that I saw on first note, or if there's any that I missed. I see various varying levels of- Thank you. Yes, we don't just have one group. They didn't just say, oh, our intermediate. So they might have intermediate, advanced, advanced high in a classroom. The lesson plan states they'll read. So they're going to read. That's one ELL mm -hmm. like task they're going to have to do. And what else? Uh, independently. 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 Timeline. Detailing. Yeah, detailing stuff. The establishment. Most, benef uh, most beneficial. Most beneficial. So they might have given us two beneficials. But what is our overall goal? To build background knowledge. Thank you. That is that when? Prior to the assignment. Prior. Prior, before. We are trying to help, which is an, an excellent ELL and ELP strategy. We sometimes call them anticipation guides. I call them like, you know, lesson trailers where I am super building background knowledge of the lesson that we're going to do. That will include vocabulary and detailed pre-instruction with visuals and examples and connection to real life and other prior knowledge really building their repertoire of stuff going in before we get into the nitty gritty. So we have a situation where there is a lesson plan and the students are going to have to read about colonization and then independently, which is a difficult task for varying levels of English language proficiency, independently complete a timeline detailing the establishment of the 13 colonies. Not an easy task, even for native English speakers with ELLs. We certainly want to make sure that we are helping build that background knowledge prior to assignments so that they have all of the knowledge necessary going in. Um, and we're supposed to find the most appropriate. When we see most, we can just assume that they've given us two sort of good and one's better based on the specifics. So let's take a look. 
which one of these would best help build background knowledge prior to the reading of the, of the text and the completion of independent timeline? The independent completion of the timeline. So we have um, the teacher presents a slideshow that depicts critical events and life in the colonies. Students create dioramas that depict critical events in establishing the colonies and share them with the class. The teacher provides students with a brief lecture of the colonies supplemented with maps. Students work in cooperative groups to complete a concept map detailing what they already know about the colonies. Well, I like that one. You check out four. <laughs> okay, well, we have two people, um, difference of opinion, one person take out four and one person four, four. So let's hear, why do, Why would you want to take it uh, four out, Miss Beasley? I want to take it out because it's asking me to detail the map detailing when it's really wanting me to, when in the question they want me to read and come up with a timeline, not the map, not details of the map. Right. And, and what is the goal about um, in this scenario? Because we always have to keep that in the, in the forefront. In fact, I'm going to text it here. Goal. The goal, isn't it reading and completing the timeline? That's the goal of the lesson. But for the activities, oh. what are we looking for? Building build background knowledge to the assignment. Build background. Background. Mom. Here's love. Prior. That's the goal. So students work in cooperative groups to complete a map detailing what they already know about the colonies. Will this help them build background knowledge prior? That, oh. I like it because they can work together. Yes, that cooperative groups is an on purpose thing that they threw in for you because that's always best practice with our ELLs. And they might gain some knowledge from their peers. But are many students like super knowledgeable about the colonies, like right off the bat? No, no, no. probably not. Even with a native English speaker, um, this activity is going to be, although it can in, in many instances, cooperative learning. And, and we, we carefully craft our groups so that they can learn from each other and be a resource. <laughs> It's not always the case that they are and that it will be the most beneficial. So this might build a little bit of very little background knowledge. Let's not erase it completely because it will do some, but let's see if any of these will do more. What about take out number one? Okay, so the teacher presenting a slideshow that depicts critical events and life in the colonies before they read about the colonization of North America. Will that build background knowledge prior to their readings? Oh, okay. yes. Yes, I understand Yeah, it certainly would. So let's not get rid of that one. What else? What else? Which, which of these, like? I would say two and three. You would say what? Get rid of them? Too. Yeah. Yeah. So what is a diorama? <laughs> um, oh. It's a like um, a nightmare for parents. <laughs> yeah, it is a nightmare for parents. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that like a model? It like, is a model. It's a model. Or... You have to have so much knowledge to create a diorama. Like, I don't know how you would do that without having any knowledge prior, you know, or very little. So apart from this being very difficult, difficult, even for native English speakers, um, and then share them with the class. What did we say? What kind of uh, ELL students did we have? Varying levels. And so we're just going to have them go in front of the class and report their diorama that they built based on very little knowledge. Does this seem like a good or the most <laughs> beneficial activity? No, no, not really not. Not. we can totally bet ourselves $5. That is not it. What else? Number three. Number three, this brief lecture. Yeah, I was going to say that, yeah. 
what about brief what what's we're trying to build back good enough background knowledge so that varying levels of ells can not only read and understand but then they'll also be able to in independently complete a timeline a brief lecture will build very little background knowledge and a brief lecture is not providing multiple pathways for success you don't just have audio learners you have visual learners tactile learners and so this is a very one path road to success and even building background knowledge right and then you you, you might have gotten a little visual with the supplemented maps but it's still a brief lecture, which means you didn't go into detail and maps without context is going to be very, very sort of meaningless or like very, very small on the on the meaningful portion. So good. Bet yourself five dollars. That is not it because it's not. OK, I really do now see why four is out because. I reread the question. Uh, thank you for highlighting the points and everyone who brought in those great um, words. But um, yeah, if the teacher is going to need to give that information, that's going to give everyone information that they need to know for their assignment. Right. And so we have yeah. we have a, an illustration or a depiction of critical events, which hello, what goes on a timeline? Critical events, um, and life in the colonies. So pictures, visual, and I'm sure she's talking via this slideshow because that's what you do when you give a slideshow. It's like audio, visual. It's a trailer. It's a lesson trailer. I am pre-showing you things you are now going to read about and the, and you will be able to have a point of reference, prior knowledge to visualize it from your reading based on the things I showed you before. You now have a point of reference to illustrate in your mind as these readings take place and, and a point of reference as you're building your timeline. So they have a better chance certainly of being able to be successful, which I already think, depending on what varying levels, I didn't say, so it could be the higher levels. I think this is a very difficult task for beginners and intermediate students. So I would imagine that the varying levels are advanced and advanced high. Just speculating here, they didn't state. So we have to assume that it's all levels, right? And, and the fact that it's a slideshow and it's visual makes it okay even for beginners, right? They could understand and get a point of reference. Are they gonna struggle with the reading? Certainly they would need much other supports um, to get that done. But this was a good question and it shows you how they try to be tricky. We know that it's best practice for them, the students to be in cooperative learning groups. However, in this cooperative learning group, they aren't gaining enough background knowledge to get them to be able to do the lesson. So that's why this one is not good enough of a, um, you know, response. So great job, everyone. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. So the answer was, I'm so sorry. The answer was A. It was, was number one. Okay. It, it, yeah. One number one. <laughs> thank you. Thank That's you. it. This is sad. I plug in your computer. <laughs> oh my God. Am I going to live? Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. It. yeah. Thank you for letting me know. Did it give a notice? I didn't even see no, it. No, I'm sorry. I've, I've, uh, I'm taking this test on Monday and I'm so oh. paranoid and I haven't slept. So I'm paying attention oh, to it. Oh my goodness. You must guys. sleep. Remember, you're doing a cognitive marathon oh, yeah. on Monday. So you <laughs> must sleep. You've got this. You can, you can do this. And you have, I have all three of the tools kids. necessary. Okay. <laughs> I had three percent. Oh my lord! Thank you for that. Save by, save by a careful eye. E excellent. Thank you. I, okay, yeah. I'll start doing that in the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. No, not at all. I'll, okay. I'll be quiet. Okay. No, don't please get, continue to be loud. Remember, a quiet classroom is not a classroom that's currently learning. You know, when it used to be the case that we wanted to walk by, our administrators wanted to walk by and see everyone writing on a 
piece of paper and all quiet. And that is not a fruitful place for learning to take place. They have to be talking and speaking and practicing, utilizing these concepts and language with each other in a way that feels natural to them. And it can only happen if they talk all the time. So speak as much as you like. A teacher notices that while students generally understand what they are reading and are able to retell or summarize texts, Many students do not understand the text at a deeper level. Which of the following techniques would be most appropriate for the teacher to use to promote all students' deeper comprehension? Lots of words. I identified in the reading some keywords and phrases. Let me see if you can tell me the ones that I chose. Able to retail. Um, let me see. Able to retail. Let me see. Promote all students. Yes, that's very important. The fact that we are promoting all students. And what is the overall goal? Deeper comprehension. Right. So one of these activities is going to be most appropriate, best at promoting deeper comprehension, a deeper understanding, not just a surface retail or summarize, summarization, a, a deeper level, a deeper understanding. So that's the goal. Um, which of the following? We're looking for a technique. So let's take a look. Leading students, uh, leading the students in a whole group reading of text, followed by a group discussion of the reading. Showing the students how to use an outline to take notes on the text and then use the notes to write text response. Providing, mm -hmm. the providing the students with adequate background knowledge to engage in the text and respond to higher level questioning. Having the students respond to the text by creating a related project, such as a series of drawings or multimedia presentation. A number two, I think, should be out. Showing students how to use an outline to take notes. Again, this is retelling and summarization, right? Mm -hmm. right. It's not a uh, deeper level of understanding. What else? Look at what they're doing in M. Answer closely. If you can explain it to me. I'm sorry. I would say three, but if I am wrong, if you can please explain to me why I'm wrong. You want to uh, get rid of three or keep it? Yes, three. Get rid of it? Yes. Okay. So three is actually a pretty good answer choice. Um, so <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it's a good, remember. The students can retell or they can summarize text, but they can't go past the text, which means they can't make connections on a deeper level. How it connects by providing students with background knowledge to engage in text discussions more than just the text, and then giving them poignant questions to think about, make those connections will undoubtedly yield a deeper understanding, a deeper level of understanding, because I gave them more knowledge. I prepared them before the reading with background knowledge on it, how this connects to the real world or their prior knowledge. And therefore, they're not just reading it at a surface level. They're reading it in connection to things we've already discussed and then responding to higher level questioning for a deeper understanding. And, and everybody would be doing that. I'm providing all students with background knowledge to help them better engage with the text. Like when I tell you guys stories about my classroom um, and when we're going over the actual standards document, that's me providing background knowledge, it, trying to illustrate for you how some of these ideas uh, connect to the standards, you know, uh, or the situations that we experience. You, you couldn't understand those standards at a surface level reading if sometimes I didn't go in and explain what does this look like? 
a, a different or changing your lesson to meet the needs of, you know, socioeconomic differences in your class or in that particular instance. Um, let's take a look at the other answer choices and see why they're not the correct. So leading the students in a whole group reading of text. What does that mean? What is a whole group reading of text? So like popcorn reading or something like where everybody takes a turn? Not quite. It's the opposite of popcorn. It's where everybody takes the same turn. It's sort of like a chorale reading. So it's like if I told everyone to read 65 with me and we all started reading it, a teacher notices that while we're, we're all reading it together. It's a whole group reading of the text. Oh, wow. Right. Out, out loud? Yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's a strategy and it's a strategy and it's for a particular grade level when you're trying to increase our younger ones the ec okay. you know early child kindergarten third grade and we're trying to increase their fluency and their phonemic awareness when we're doing choral reading of some of the um easier texts it's a really great way to have our students participate and read and not feel like embarrassed if they mispronounce or if and so we there is a place for it no, that makes sense. Okay, that does right. make sense. Right, but I'm not here. <laughs> okay. Not here. Not okay. um, not to get the, it doesn't, whole group reading does not increase comprehension. It increases fluency. Okay. So that's why this is out, because this would not work. Okay. I'm glad you clarified on the whole group reading as like a cult, because yeah, I was probably going to think popcorn reading, and, and I probably would have picked that answer. <laughs> Yeah, so the whole group is everyone together reading mm -hmm. the text, and then we'll have a discussion about it. But I mean, truly, when you whole group read, um, you, 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 there's not a lot of comprehension. We're really going for fluency at the time. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying. Absolutely. What about number four? So are we giving the students a an option of any sort of project that fits with what they like to do. Like they can make a video, they can do drawings, they can do um, an essay, they can do anything they like, what they like to um, convey the material. Right. Class yeah, or whatever. That's true. And that's why, that's why I think that these two are actually the, the best answer choices. Three and four are the ones that they wanted you to like get down to and think which one of these is better. Which one of these is better to promote deeper comprehension? Um, which one of these can we be assured it, it's going to have that effect? A deeper understanding. Three. Mm, I four. I mean, if I, I, uh, I see, uh, I'm, I'm, if I can have my students do anything that they want to as their project, then probably four. Let's see. Let me see if I can go back and see what, if I can find something that makes it more obvious. As a teacher Fine. notices that while reading students generally understand what they are reading about. So they're reading guys. This is something having to do with the reading exercise. We want them to get a deeper understanding of the reading. Having the students um, respond to the text by creating a project, like a drawing or a multimedia presentation, uh, will that tell us that they have a deeper understanding or will they be able to summarize and retell better? Summarize, okay. retell. summarize and retell. Okay, so number three. It is number three. It's number three. And this was a very difficult question and it very specific to like what they already can do. We know that they can like, that they get the gist of it. We're really trying to see, can they go beyond what is written there and make connections to their life To And so having higher level questioning that you can check for deeper comprehension after giving them more than just the text, more context to be able to dive deeper into the content. How do we feel about this one? Good. That was a lot of, what did you say? Cognitive when you were referring to the test. Yeah, cognitive, cognitive fatigue. Yeah, it's, oh, yes. For sure. I was like, it was a yeah, this one was hard. It is, it is. And they, they try to be tricky. And, and once we sort of see it, like for what it is, it seems more obvious, right? Like, okay, I see why this is better for 
what they were already doing. Um, but if you're not looking for it, man, four looks good. And you know why four looks better than three? Because I even had to, you know, stop myself with it because we do want to always try to offer them, you know, um, their own choice to give them agency, to be expressive, to, to choose how to visually represent and have that be a part of it. But when we're looking for deeper comprehension, we're going to want to be more poignant and focused on our, um, you know, the types of questioning that we give to make sure that it in fact is deep comprehension and not just retail or summative. All right. Before seventh grade students begin a research project, the teacher provides criteria for evaluating online sources. Which of the following approaches would be most effective in further promoting the student's ability to evaluate online sources? We read the question. I, I saw some things that I want to, or that like, you know, I feel like I need, we need to pay attention to. You guys tell me what, what's important here. Research. Evaluating. Criteria. They Yeah, they want to evaluate online sources, right? The teacher provides criteria already. This is seventh graders. They're about to begin the research project. What are we looking for? The ability to evaluate online sources. That's the goal. The goal is to get these seventh graders a better ability, a stronger ability to evaluate online sources. We gave them a criteria, but but we're looking for an approach after that, like that um, that will further promote their ability to evaluate online sources. So that's the goal. Let's read the answer choices and ask ourselves, which one of these can we throw out? Providing guidelines for conducting efficient advanced keyword searches, demonstrating how to locate bibliographies on particular subject or subject areas, discussing ways to supplement online research with interviews and surveys, introducing basic principles for considering the authority and reputation of a source. We can take out number one. Right, this will not help us evaluate credibility, right? Evaluate the, uh, the the online source as you know credible or useful or garbage one does not do that a keyword I would, search. I would say number three number three number three will not at all provide added support for them to be able to evaluate online sources remember she gave criteria and this is an extra step what else could we do to help them the students be able to do it you can cross out two. Two yeah. does not do it. Just them knowing where a bibliography is or, or how to access it, locate it, um, that will not help them, you know, evaluate online sources. I mean, it, it, it won't. <laughs> we need to introduce basic principles for them, the students, considering the authority that's writing it, and if it's in the reputation of the source, where's the source coming from? That will add added, added um, promotion of their abilities. Having that knowledge will further promote their abilities to um, think about the different online sources that they that they access and to be able to evaluate them for, you know, for use. Any questions on this one? All right, where, where do we go? Okay. Okay. All right, so we have an English language arts teacher is preparing guidelines for public speaking for use by students to avoid potential cultural insensitivity the teacher should eliminate which of the following guidelines from the list. Okay, what are we doing here? What keywords and phrases do we need to pay attention to? What's the goal? 
Uh, culture and sensitivity. Oh, culture and sensitivity. Yes. All right, potential, and we want to avoid it. Avoid it. Mm -hmm. She needs to eliminate. Eliminate uh, one, right? Not. Yeah. An English language arts teacher. And we're public speaking. Speaking. To avoid potential cultural insensitivity. We're trying to avoid cultural insensitivity, thereby eliminating one of these. Let's take a look at it and which one of these would best help do that. Make eye contact with several individuals in the audience. Avoid reading your notes word for word during the speech. Practice delivering your speech until you feel confident. If you get nervous, slow down a bit and take a full breath. Remember, the goal is to avoid potential cultural insensitivity when preparing guidelines for the students. The students are going to use these. And which of these would be culturally insensitive to any of them um, when we're talking about speaking and doing an activity for speaking? Which would one it be make eye contact? It is. Why? What? Uh, it is. And so, typically, I'd like to, you know, get rid of them one by one. But this is not related to culture. This is not related to culture. This is not related to culture. This sometimes is related to culture and or disability. So you have um, students who have difficulty maintaining eye contact when speaking. It's part of their disability. We would never force a student um, to do that. <clears throat> as they're speaking, as long as they're up there. I mean, the rest of us can deal with not making or maintaining eye contact. Um, and also you have students from other cultures where um, you don't you know, maintain eye contact while you're speaking. And it takes a while for them to get out of that um, sort of looking down as they're speaking, especially if, it, if it's to you know, a, an authority figure like a teacher or classmates. So um, our ELL students might not yet make eye contact, all of them. Um, and so obviously we would practice with while we're talking to them, maintaining eye contact with them. We certainly want, wouldn't want to take off points or make them feel bad for not being able to do it. So the insensitivity, cultural and actually disability wise, would be uh, make eye contact with several individuals in the audience. If they can make eye contact with one person and maintain it, that's fine, you know? And if not, we'll work on it, we'll work on it. I'll work on it with you, myself, while we're speaking to each other and you or while you're in your other areas. But we certainly aren't gonna put you on a public forum and then, uh, you know, take off points as a result of you not being able to do that yet. All right, so. Okay, a middle school teacher is evaluating classroom assessment practices and identifying assessment outcomes with regard to students Texas essential knowledge and skills mastery. Which of the following statements best describes the value of using an assessment matrix with the reading teaks for this purpose. What? Let's take a look at all the keywords and phrases. Middle school teacher. She's middle school, that's right. Classroom assessments. She is evaluating classroom assessment practices. That's important. What does this mean in layman's terms that she's doing? She's measuring classroom practices. She's measuring her own measurements, right? The ways mm -hmm. in which she assesses the students, she is evaluating it. She is assessing her assessments, essentially, right? And identifying assessment outcomes. What is the outcome of the assessment with regard to what? The law. <laughs> Right, exactly. Teeks mastery is the law, in fact, with the law. She is measuring her, evaluating them, checking them to see if they are doing what they're supposed to be doing with regards to Texas essential knowledge and skills in layman's terms. This middle school teacher is assessing her own assessment practices and then 
identifying the outcomes with regards to the TEKS mastery. Are they doing, is it doing, assessing what it's supposed to, and are my students getting mastery in those TEKS? So the question is asking us, which of the following statements, they've given us, I hate these ones, which of the following statements best, they want a description, what best describes what we just sort of talked about. The value of using an assessment matrix, assessment matrix is think of a Excel sheet with all of your assessments that you utilize and the different teaks and how well the, it, it's helping get your students to where it needs to be. And they're using it for reading teaks, right? They're using an assessment matrix, sort of a data, uh, an assessment of an assessment, if you will. And they wanna look for why is she doing that? Why is, she, is it best for her to use the assessment matrix when she's doing this evaluation of her, her own assessment practices? So let's take a look. Oops, sorry. The matrix collects observational assessment data at multiple points during the lesson, providing information about the student's strengths and challenges in relationships to each TEKS. The matrix organizes information about the TEKS and assessment methods, allowing teachers to make effective assessment plans. The matrix represents each assessment data point in a visual model informing teachers of the best tool to use the best tool to use to assess each teak. The matrix provides um, represent a representative sample of the assessment options used to assess each teaks, helping teachers make appropriate choices. What's our goal or what's going on in this scenario? We're looking for a, what is the best description of why she's doing what she's doing and utilizing the assessment matrix. Remember, she's evaluating, middle school teacher, evaluating her own assessment practices. That's it, all the ways in which she assesses. And she's also identifying like mastery outcomes for TEKS. So will we take out one? Let's see, why would we take out one? Give me give me why we can bet ourselves $5. You're right, one is not the answer, but why? Because of the observational, she wants to, she's um, the observational points during the lesson. You didn't say anything about that, right? Right. None at all. It's talking about all, I mean, observational assessment is a type of assessment and I'm sure that's on her assessment matrix. It didn't talk about that. It didn't talk about, providing information about students' strengths, challenges, and the relationship to each TEAC. None of that happens in there. She's assessing all of her assessment practices, evaluating them matched up against her TEAKs to see, is it working what I'm doing? Am I measuring what I'm supposed to? Am I getting the data that I, I need? Or do I need to change? Do I need to change my assessment methods to, see, to get a better understanding? Okay. What else? Number four. Number four, it does not provide a representative sample used to assess each teaks. It, it that's not what it does. And not what and she number, remember what she's two. doing. The goal for the teacher is she's evaluating her assessment practices. I would say number three also. Number three. Yeah. Right. Number three is out. It is not informing which tool is best to use to assess each teak. It is a, the matrix organizes information concerning the teaks and also her own assessment methods and makes it more effective for her to plan because she knows what is hitting, what, what is not. And it allows for her to make effective. And remember, one of our overarching goals for each, for domains one and three is effective and appropriate assessment that, that measures what it's supposed to measure that is a clear picture of the TEKS and the student's mastery. And so a matrix will allow us, uh, an assessment matrix will allow the teacher to assess her own um, assessment practices for mastery in the TEKS.
Can I see the question real quick? Absolutely. All right, there was a lot in that. There one. was a lot in there. A lot okay. of work. All right, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Okay. An eighth grade teacher notices that several students tend to dominate speaking opportunities in the classroom. The teacher is planning a literature unit that will include whole class instruction and small group collaboration on a project. The teacher wants to ensure that all students will have opportunities to have their voices heard during these activities. Which of the following instructional practices would be most appropriate for the teacher to use? Okay, keywords and phrases. What is the goal here? Dominant speaking opportunities. And that all of their voices are heard. Yeah, all students have the opportunity to have voices heard during whole class instruction and small group collaboration, right? So we have yeah. a few teach just few students in this eighth grade class that Bogart, right? They they that this was probably me growing up, honestly. <laughs> um, but like they have a couple of eager beavers in the class that really dominate speaking opportunities. And this is a problem. Everybody needs to be talking. Yes, it's beneficial for me if I'm talking, and it might be beneficial for some to listen, but we need everybody practicing, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, everyone on board. So we want to best ensure that all students have this opportunity to practice their voice, have their ideas heard, and we're looking for an instructional practice that the teacher should use that is most appropriate, meaning they may have given us more than one. But we want one that is best for the, the specifics of what we're trying to achieve and the specifics of, um, you know, the, the scenario. So let's take a look at the answer choices. I'm sorry that they're not all together. This is kind of annoying. Next time I'm going to put them on like slides, like so that they're just one all on one slide, not on this huge document. So we have assigning the students clear roles and providing a rubric for the students to use to assess their academic discussion skills. Having the students use a mobile application to communicate about the project during class and at home. Demonstrating effective listening, turn-taking, and speaking behaviors that students can apply during group work. Encouraging the students to ask their classmates for clarification and elaboration during a disagreement. So what do we see that you're like, I can bet myself $5, that's not it. Number two? Yeah, number two is not it. Mobile application at home. And we wanna do in whole class, this is in the classroom and this is small group, right? We want them to talk more in the class, not at home. So this is wrong. Sorry. Can we see number four? Can I know, I'm so bit? sorry. Let me move it up. There, there we go. go. That's fine. Thank you. Well, Chihuahuas did it again. I'm going to make it smaller. Number four? Yeah. Okay. Number four? Yeah, encouraging the students to ask their classmates for clarification and elaboration during an agreement. Remember, our goal, and let me get my handy-dandy marker out again, our goal is that all students ensuring that they will have the opportunity, ensuring it. Will encouraging the students to like clarify and elaborate during the disagreement ensure that all students will have an ability to speak? No. It will not. Maybe some will take the opportunity and I guarantee you that not a lot of them are gonna to wanna to chime in during a disagreement. So you're left with the two most appropriate one is more appropriate um than the other i would take out one i think it's one i don't know maybe i'm wrong okay well let's take a look yeah, we, wanna, take out one. 
let's look at our um our goals we want them to be to have all for all students to have a voice we have some students that are so okay with dominating speaking opportunities but we need everyone to to feel empowered and we have people who are being too powerful and they need to also learn some things right is it a good thing to always dominate the speaking opportunity and not allow for others no nope. no and so which one of these would be beneficial for all students so where the dominating speaking students will learn and those that are shy will also learn which one of these will, will be best number three Right, it is number three. Number three is the um, best approach, the in best instructional practice, because you can tell them, like, let's say I gave them a clear list and clear roles, and I told them on my list, you must effectively listen to each other. You must take turns and use these speaking behaviors, but they haven't used them or seen them or practiced them they're not going to be applied just from a list. They might with some of them, right? Who are already proficient in those in those sk speaking skills, right? You have to learn to be a good listener. It's something we have to teach, active listening, right? Skills and to be a good group partner. Um so number 3 does better for all students because we are going to make sure that even the dominating speaking ones are learning from this process process yes they'll still be able to speak but their listening skills are, are going to get better they're being able to take turns and and um you know exhibiting those speaking behaviors better or, um is going to be more fruitful than just to give everyone a clear role clear roles is limiting clear roles uh, as far as like you're the speaker for the group well now you've just cut everybody out from being able to speak and and uh clear roles are important in other fashions like procedural and sort of like logistics of the group working but for speaking we want to really give them opportunities a great way to do this if you have students who are just not doing well with group um having them do a like a role play if you give them a script and in the script everybody has a role uh and and they read it and one person is like doing things effectively possibly not and they are able to illustrate and see how how effective communication would take place and ways in which some of the negative behaviors are limiting to you know that fruitful conversation any questions guys nope <clears throat> Uh, I actually do have a question. Sure. Um, are these questions similar to Pearson's? They are. Like, do they come from the Pearson website, in other words? Yeah, they I, they come directly. It's like I didn't make these. These come directly from Pearson exams. They are. I I've been collecting them. Um, they give practice questions for each of the content areas. And in each of the content areas, the bulk of the questioning is about the content, right? It's content specific. If it's English language arts and reading, it's about all that. If it's math, it's about all that. But there's like a handful of questions on the exam and on those practice ones that are particular, not to math, but it's about your instruction, your implementation of uh, you know strategies and your assessment. They're specific to pedagogy in every single content exam. There's a handful of questions. So I've just been collecting Collecting all the pedagogy ones and putting them in here for us to practice with because they literally give us nothing to work with or very little I should say so yes these are directly from Pearson and their pedagogy questions okay thank you so much absolutely oh, bless you Let's see. oh and a baby sounds sick Yes, we all have allergies, unfortunately. Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. this right weather is oh, terrible. Yes. This weather is like, getting I just can't yeah. keep up. I really can't. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So let's like, take a look at this one. A sixth grade English language arts teacher wants to foster a positive relationship between students and the course content where students begin to see their classroom as a, com a writing community. Which of the following approaches would be most appropriate for the teacher to use to promote 
higher student expectations for themselves in the class. So let's take a look at this, a lot of words. What keywords and phrases? What is the goal here? What are we trying to do here? Sixth grade English language arts teacher. Sixth grade English. All right. Positive relationship between students and the content. Foster, she wants to help create positive relationship between students and the course content. But specifically, even more specifically, she wants them to consider themselves part of a writing community. That's the goal That's awesome. for this. Yeah, absolutely. She wants for them to not just think of themselves like, yes, I'm going to my English class. She wants for them to think of like, yeah, I'm going to go to my writing community and get my writing on. To have that sense and that culture of writing within the, the sixth grade class. So we're looking for an approach that would do that, that she could use to help promote higher student right. expectations from themselves. We have high expectations. We want them to have high expectations of themselves. So she's kind of wanting to do two things, you know, create this um, com writing community that would help promote their expectations of themselves. And which of these things below would do that best? Let's take a look. Encouraging students to communicate frequently with classmates about their writing outside of class. Meeting with students on a regular basis to confer about their writing and to establish their author identity. Mm -hmm. Having students use a secure online platform where they can share their work with classmates. Working with students to create a rubric that will be used to evaluate each other's collective achievement. What can you throw away right away? Because it's not it. I would say two. Uh, I say four. Okay, well, let's hear let's hear your your reasoning behind the two. Because right? you can't, we have to give ourselves a reason and bet ourselves five dollars. That's not it. So why is two not it? Why would that not help? create a, um, the sense of a writing community and, and having the students have expectations, higher expectations of themselves. What? Or number four, why would that not do it? Why does number four not really, is it, is it conducive to a writing community? I don't think so because I wouldn't, I, I want that I, I was in that uh, writing community and I was trying to foster something positive. I wouldn't want to all of a sudden see a rubric. Exactly. And, and this like achievement business. Yeah. You know, achievement is subjective, right? There are, have been exactly. many authors that have broken the rules of very established rubrics and, and really came out with meaning. And so here she is not trying to make her students be the best, uh, in their achievement in writing, she's trying to make them feel like they're in a community of writers, right? In a writing community. Beginning with the achievement, that's not the best way to do it. It's so that that rubric is not gonna translate into, I feel like I'm part of a writing community per se. Um, I don't- yeah, really I don't, not the goal. I don't think that's, yeah, I don't think that's a higher expectation. No, it's not. It's the normal mm -hmm. expectation. And what is this collective achievement? Like we all have to, I don't even know what that means. Yeah. Each other's collective achievement together. We, we want us to think of, we want the students to think of the writing community and for them to have high expectations of themselves in particular, not collectively. So which one of these doesn't create, she wants them to begin to see the classroom, this physical space that they enter every day with her, she wants them to see that as a writing community. Which one of these answer choices is not inside the classroom? Number three. Number three is online and at home, right? Right. Online, not in the classroom. Or I mean, it could be at home. What else? We're left with one, two. Number one. Is wrong? Is it number, I mean, number one says outside of class. Right. Mm -hmm. Outside of class. Oh, yeah, I like, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to contradict anybody, but I do like number two because it's establishing their own identity as an author. And it's, 
Right. And, it, and we want to promote that. So two is the right answer. One, encouraging like this might create a buzz of like talking about it, but it's not necessarily going to make them feel like I'm part of a writing community. Who's part of a writing community? Just like F, who who is normally? What people are authors. part of writing community? Authors. We authors. want our students to consider themselves authors. Like I tell my daughters all the time, they write stuff for me all the time. And I tell them they're authors and they always joke that they're not. And I say, absolutely you are. You know, they create little chapter books for me and they illustrate them. And that they're not on a bookshelf to be sold is not the definition of an author, you know, and to be part of a writing community, they have to start thinking of themselves as an author, right? As someone who uh, has skills and something worthy to say. The fact that they're going to be meeting with the teacher to on a regular basis, so this consistency to talk about their writing it's going to foster a positive relationship between the students and the course content. They're talking about their writing, talking about ways in which, um, you know, they do things particular in their writing, establishing their own identity as an author, thereby creating that um, sense of community of writing within the classroom. Think about it, because I, 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 I used to do this all the time. I would have many interviews. The, the unfortunate thing, and remember, this is a theoretical exam, but for instance, when I taught at PSJ North, very often I had like 130 something students. And so I, it was A day, B day, which is why I had so many. But we, we um, when we had 90 minute periods, I could, you know, feasibly have many interviews with them about like a, a three minute conversation about the things that you wrote or about your readings, which I would often do like, and the, and it, it was a way of keeping them accountable and getting them to like, you know, practice academic specific language and ideas with me. I could ask questions like, who's the protagonist in your story? Do you think like, really? And like, what's the conflict? And they'd have to describe it to me. So having those conversations with me, little ones, um, builds rapport, sets them at ease, gets them to actually do do the reading and think about themselves in a in a different in a different way, and it helps you assess, right? It helps you assess, you know, their their understanding and builds that communication, which we always want to keep. It's not always possible to meet with each and every one of them in real life, but it's certainly the goal theoretically. All right, guys, my oldest is, um, what, one moment. I'm going to just put you on mute because I think my oldest is going to work. Right All right. So um, are there any questions? There are more questions here and we'll go over them. And I also skipped some of them. And like I said, I'm still like compiling all of the different content areas and all of the, you know, pedagogically specific um, questions that there are. So we'll have more for Wednesday. And I'm going to right now, before I forget, add this to our... EPR right, so everybody is now going to see those that we were using um let's see do you guys have any questions for me I have a few um, yeah. <laughs> Don't mind. No, not at all. I don't ask away. Uh, one, where is that drive at? Um, is that where um, you originally sent the link for your YouTube videos? That's correct. So it's the second okay. link there. Um, okay. It's that second link and they, everything should be there. If, you, if it's not there, um, certainly okay. just send me an email and I send it to you right away. Okay. Also, um, I have been watching those and just destroy and that's just taking a lot of a lot of notes uh, and and going through this material my own material and um 
anyway, uh, so, but one thing that would help, it's there an order <laughs> because I'll be on one thing and struggling to answer some things and wanting to go to the next video to see if you fall, you know, did go back and answer like some of the questions that were already posted. Um, and I can't find that video. So is there like a, uh, I'm trying to look up certain dates and they'll say like eight months ago and things like that, but I can't. Right. I try, I'm trying my best to organize them by like, um, concept like, right so like domain I, one is instructional planning and assessment effective for all students which includes students diversity so i've tried to lump them together like that but i need okay. to go back and do it again the ones uh at the very end are are the the newer ones like those haven't been like you know put in right. order um i'm also going to try to do them in different playlists like do the ppr instructional planning or like maybe domain one playlist where okay. all the main videos are there and domain two playlists where all the videos are there um, to give a little bit more order to those, because I know there's so many and they're just like kind of everywhere. So I'll do a better job of that. I'll make that my well, home tomorrow. Um, you're doing great. I mean, they are. I, I mean, as far as that's concerned, they're they're amazing. I just like okay. So for example, um, one that I was I have here is a uh, list of like practice questions. Um, the very first one does have the answer, and it's just about a first grade student who's teaching her students about sounds okay. and that one has the answer and then the second one on there like I have been trying to research this answer on so many different platforms and I cannot find it and I can't find a follow-up video where maybe you've gone back over it um and it's if I can ask you just sure if, absolutely okay I mean, so actually, let me open it up on my thing right now let me open the okay. If, do you know which I, I, I know about? exactly which one because it's the one that doesn't have that like the for some reason the the what is it the answer key is not there and and that's I mean that's right. uh, yeah but yeah so let me share this with you so you can see it in a I I'm, I'm trying to get but like, I know I'm, I'm taking this Monday and then I'm so silly I have I, that Monday morning then that afternoon I have jury duty which is <gasps> awesome oh my god what Three kind of kids? kids and i'm just like what am i doing to myself good luck yes so good i luck. just kind of like what do i hit because i'm trying to hit everything and ah uh, i think you're I ready did. i think you're ready no and I i'm not like <laughs> so not i'm not i did the pearson thing a while ago mm -hmm. and i and i passed it all with green so i feel okay but i'm like but those questions if you didn't, they give you all the, it's the same questions if you need to retake it. So I don't feel exactly. like. I know. Yeah, that's, and the thing is, is that we have such limited um, practice questions and, and, you know, they, they are increasingly more challenging. And so it's unfortunate that like, for instance, the PPR manual, those questions haven't been updated in decades. They're still the ones that they provide on the website for Pearson, which is preposterous to me because I know it's not the ones that they give you on the exam. So to the ones on the practice exam, it's just those ones. It's not like they give you a different one so that you can, you know, get better at it. So we just have to, um, try to be as mindful as possible remember best practices and identify those keywords and phrases to try to sort of suss out the the most appropriate um so i think it was this document you're talking about yes exactly so i I'm, I'm kind of stuck on the second one and i feel okay. horrible because i have uh, i have a i don't know i just i have a group of delpa students and i'm just like, like we just took delpa this week and it's like Ah, how am I not doing that? How can that's, I not do that? that's okay. So let's say Mr. Angeles has a diverse group of students, several of which are English language learners. He notices that during collaborative activity, some of his ELL students are not speaking unless asked a question. He would like for all students to give commentary and engage in discourse within their groups. Which of the following activities would best help develop students oral language proficiency okay what keywords and phrases i'm sorry this is like an awful like it's this not even good no i have it here in front of me so okay. i have it. it's diverse yes um, and then there's several um english language learners um and then 
that he notices that students are not speaking when asked questions and he wants them all to be able to engage within their groups. Um, but what activities would best help develop oral language proficiency? Right. So those are, I basically underlined everything. Right. Um, so, but what's the goal here? What's the goal for Mr. Angeles to increase what? Develop, develop student oral proficiency. Oral the, language proficiencies. And what does that mean? Oral language proficiency means? That means that the, he, they would like him to be able to speak with, um, with, uh, uh, with everyone, but right. Point. But yeah. especially inside of the, the cooperative the groups, group. right? Yeah. Oral language proficiency, proficiency, um, is the ability to listen and speak. Mm -hmm. listening and speaking skills. So which one of these is going to increase the student's practice with listening and speaking skills? So I would say, I, I put down, um, I put down that I, I, I got rid of the, uh, I, I don't know, like I, so many of them, I was like, okay, I could see this no and then yes, and then no and then yes, okay. Um, so D, no, even though like one way, a lot of times people talk about watching TV uh, cartoons in a language can help you talk. Um, I got rid of D. Yeah. It might help you maybe uh, with your listening skills, maybe, um, but, but not your, or not your speaking skills, not the other half. Remember oral is oral language is listening and speaking. Okay. Um, Answering on grade level comprehensive questions with Mr. Uh, Angeles before group activities I could help prep them and maybe feel more comfortable. Um, writing personal narrative stories in English and reading their work to Mr. Angeles. Okay, that's. But he wants for them to be able to give commentary and engage in discourse. Discourse is when it's not prompted and you can just dialogue with someone because I understood their 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 message yeah. and I'm able to just on the fly organically comment on it so i got rid of that one even though it did help them right yeah, exactly it's something they got uh, comfortable with but i was like going back and forth um so having frequent conversations with him is that it that is absolutely it okay. having frequent conversations about all sorts of things Whatever. what did you do Juanito this weekend oh you had to do chores did your brothers and sisters help you who has to do what? They're just listening for the message and speaking, becoming more fluent with their discourse and dialogue socially, but so they feel more comfortable to do it academically. Okay. All right. That one threw me. I, I answered um, a lot of these and then some of them, I was like, I don't even know what this is. Like, I don't know what. Is there another one? <laughs> Number also, eight. I have a question also. I was going over this one. I did not see no answers. So I have several of them that I'm iffy about. I don't know if you want to maybe answer them and then upload it to the drive. From this one? Yes, or maybe do like a, a separate sheet. Yes, and just, I'll, do, I'll do that, the separate sheet of. Uh, do the separate sheet and just add it there. And yes, I can be because I was breaking my head so bad. I'm like, oh my you God. Too? Like it's, I'm like, at this point, I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, I don't even, so number, like number eight on that one, I was like, oh gosh, I don't. And then and a lot of these kind of, uh, anyway. Yeah, just, these are a little bit more towards like science of teaching, reading a little bit. Yeah, because I never seen yeah. that. Yeah, I think those are just like on the wrong document and we can take those yeah. out. The ones about semi-phonetic, like these are more um, science of teaching, reading, um, specific. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to ask you specifics about content and these are content specific. So actually I'm not sure why they're on this list. So I can take out number nine, 10. Uh, you can take out number eight. Okay, thank goodness. Because I couldn't find that anywhere in my book. Oh. Yeah, seven, uh, eight, nine, um, 10. Yeah, you can take out 10 too. Then, uh, 
and Thank 11. You. you know what? This is just in the wrong thing. Like all of this is mostly in the wrong thing. I'm Miss looking- said that I figured and I wanted to address it to you, but thank like you for somebody I'm telling not, me. I'm not <laughs> so I'm like not, I'm no oh one, right? This is your stuff. So um, yes, I did find all of this not very relevant to what right. I'm thank you. It's studying. just yeah, it, it's just not um there's two different like content areas going on here it's clear some of its ppr and some of it seems to be str i'm not sure why um that happened it was obviously me but i do apologize and thank you so much for pointing it out because i now have to fix it um this question here is a question regarding um pedagogy because that's i was like at this point i started to give up after like after oh, no seven, i'm so sorry oh, no you're fine i was like i'm gonna move on and put a pin in this and ask um, i was on the same page i just kind of put it aside i'm like okay i'm done breaking I'm my like, head with this. i was like okay i got really i got to eight and then i was like what <laughs> yes I and started- i think i think eight is where and like all of this well this is too um yeah i'm sorry guys no, that's okay. I mean, this is PPR and some of it is not. It's just like a mix of uh, a jumbled mess. But so I will fix this for you guys and also put the um, the answer key and also the answer key to the document that we're using right now. Because remember, I got those from the uh, yeah from the other Pearson content specific exams related specifically to pedagogy. And so um, those are all the answers are also not there there. You would have to go search on all each of the individual tests, which I don't want you to do that. So I will also put that up there for you. No, I appreciate your time. Thank you. I I mean, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I mean, I, 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 I have done a lot. Um, I mean, through teacher builder, I mean, there's a lot of absolutely modules and then um, once this